Welcome. I am here today with Mitch Gray. Mitch is a small business consultant and author of How to Hire and Keep Great People. And that is what caught my eye. And Mitch, I was trying to remember, I think I saw, so here's the book for people listening, watching on video. I think I must have seen pictures of like your signing event um, at the co-working space on social. And I think I reached out to Kayla and said, Kayla, who, you know, who is this guy and, and is how's the book and should, should I have him on the podcast because hiring is such a hot topic. So Mitch works at Firehouse Workspace, which is in Clovis, New Mexico, and did a book signing event there. So welcome, Mitch. Yes, thank you so much. I'm excited for our conversation and, and we're going to help a lot of people today. So I'm ready to go. I'm awesome. ready to go. Okay, well, first we have to give a shout out to Kayla Adair, who uh, is the owner of Firehouse Workspace. And um, she, Mitch was just kind of walking me through sort of the culture in Clovis and that what Kayla's doing is really forward looking. And so she, you know, created, she bought the building, rehabbed the building and is creating this community. And she's really passionate about helping local entrepreneurs. So Kayla, thank you for introducing the two of us, if you're listening. So Mitch, I was interested in this conversation because hire, I feel like hiring today is such a, it's always a big topic, right? And you speak on this topic, you know, based yeah. on your book, it sounds like, you know, this is kind of one of the hot topics that always really resonates with an audience. And yeah. you mentioned one of the stories you tell at the beginning of the book is, you know, wanting to get people's attention and using the hiring topic as a way to kind of reel people in. And of course, everybody can relate to, you know, how hard it is to find great people. And, right. and I was, you know, starting to say before we hit record, I feel like, especially today, we're sort of in this scarcity mindset around, you know, a lot of people making changes, great people who used to do other things are kind of in the marketplace. And so can we attract those people, um, you know, a lot of folks seeing shortages in staff and just all the, you know, challenges and maybe opportunities, but uh, yeah, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. And yeah, tell us, so tell us a little bit about how you got into, and your background's really interesting, yeah. how, how you got here to, to sort of be really passionate about helping people hire great people. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for touching on that pain point because that, that's exactly how I ended up writing the book. Um, so a little about my background. I have kind of, as you mentioned, an interesting background. It's kind of a back, you know, that old cartoon, Dennis the Menace, uh -huh. and it would show the map of Dennis and he's just, you know, the map is everywhere when it would have yes. taken him like five minutes, to, you know, in <laughs> yeah. a linear line. Um, we know that's life isn't linear period. And for some of us, uh, it, it becomes even more interesting. And that's kind of been mine. Um, in the book, I kind of open up with I, I'm a pastor at heart. Since I was 10 years old, all I wanted to do was be a pastor. And um, I went to seminary and, and did that. And most seminaries, a lot of them are shortened. So it's basically a four year degree in two years. Uh, they, they, they don't mess around. You go eight hours a day, five days a week. And, and boy, when you get done with that, <laughs> you're like, okay, it's, you know, I kind of equate it to my son right now is finishing up his master's degree. And he's like, I'm done with school once I'm done with this. And that's how you feel, you know? And so after I got done with seminary, I, I thought I need a little break, you know, had a family at the time. Our son was uh, on his way about to be born. And so I needed to make money. But I just wanted kind of a respite from the rigors of long days, long study, et cetera. So I went to work for a, a high fashion retail company called The Buckle. And I had done a part time retail job in high school. I was good at it. I love people. I'm like, hey, if I got to go make money, let's do this for a little bit, then get back into ministry. <laughs> Six months later, they put me in charge of a multi million dollar store. I moved up really quickly. And that's really where I fell in love with. Um, connecting my heart for people and business. And I've never, you know, I was 21, 22 at the time. I've never separated personal uh, passion for people and business. To me, to me, they should be one and the same. And I think the most uh, impactful leaders in a positive way, I think they get that principle that you can't separate business and person. I mean, life is life. And so to put your energy into this idea that I can't run my business and treat people the right way, 
Um, I just think that's a mistake. And so anyway, I, I fell in love with business. Um, six months later, I set out to run my own multi-million dollar store. I, I had not been trained how to hire. I had not been trained how to recruit. Right. That's the buckle. And, and the buckle is one of the greatest companies, you know, uh, that, that exists. I mean, their culture is amazing. But even a great company like that doesn't necessarily train people how to do those things. And so I just did what I knew how to do. And that was hire everybody I could hire. And I think after my first year, I handed out 110 tax forms. Now, my team on average was 12 to 15 people. So think about that. Wow. A team of 12 to 15, I handed out 110 tax forms. What that meant was I was just strategically going through the mill trying to find the right people. And I learned that's not the right way. <laughs> right. <laughs> Trial by. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the crazy thing is that that's kind of how most people do. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. But I did go back into ministry eventually. I spent five years at the buckle and it was great, but my heart for ministry was still there. I, I accepted a job and it was my favorite job I've ever had. Three years later, I got fired. No real reason. Again, I talk about that in the book as well. And so what that did is that kind of entered me into this interesting background of having the heart of a pastor, no longer no longer wanting to work in church because I got burned there multiple times and really spending the next decade trying to figure out, man, I really love business. I love helping people. But how in the world did those two go together? And it took me a little while to figure that out. Um, and so what I landed on was business leaders are stressed. Uh, business leaders go home at night and they worry about their business. Compassionate business leaders worry about Sarah, who's pregnant, and Mike, who's going through a divorce, and you know Julie, whose kid is graduating, and how they're going to take a vacation to go see their kid. I mean, compassionate business leaders deal with all that. And 98% of the American economy is built of small business. It yeah. makes up 99% of our revenue as a mm -hmm. country economically. Um, and so that's the majority of business leaders. And so in my head, I'm like, okay, how do we make sense of this? So about seven, eight years ago, I started kind of probing, asking business leaders, figuring things out. And the thing I heard over and over again, almost every conversation I had, we can't find people. Eight, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was running a store in a mall and the other mall managers are like, we can't find people. I'm like, I'm finding people everywhere. <laughs> so then I just started reflecting on my experience, the lessons I had learned, the words I'd heard people say, the actions I had seen, the mistakes I had made. And I'm like, oh, okay, there's something to this, right? So then I started looking for books and guess what I didn't find many of? I didn't find many books on hiring. I didn't find hardly any books on interviewing. I found very few books on how to recruit. And so then that was 18 years ago. Well, then as time passed and all these third-party agencies and apps began being introduced, yeah. that changed the game even more. What I think that did, and I know those have a place. I have a lot of friends who have gotten jobs through those places. So they do have a place. They're a tool in the toolbox. But what I think those third-party apps did is they made people really lazy, really, really lazy. Because as a business leader, it's so much easier for me to go on one of those websites and throw my ad out. And I don't have to spend two hours a week recruiting. The downside of that is you're just replicating in a different way what I did at 22 years old. You're just running through the turnstile. And what I tell people all the time, there's no way you can replicate or help people clarify what your culture is through a third-party app. There is no way you can put flesh and blood on a third-party app. There is no way you can replicate those things technologically. And there never will be because you can't replace flesh and blood. And so after all that, I was like, I'm going to write a book about it and let's see where it goes. And um, I, I, I'm really proud of this book. I think it's helping a lot of people. The amazing thing about this book is a lot of a lot of employees are reading this book and they're going, oh, wait a second. I want to work at that place. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. 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 Which was really, to me, a surprising response. I, I, I didn't set out with that response, but that's been a lot of the response we're getting. And so tying all my last 25 years of background and interesting things to what's going to make common sense in the workplace and I tried to make a book that was so understandable and palatable. 
you know, someone once said, I can't think of who it was, but someone once said a great writer takes really difficult things and makes them seem Mm -hmm. sensible and common and understandable. And that's what I set out to do with this book is I was like, I want, I want the uneducated solopreneur who has a passion for building business to pick up this book and go, I can do that. I don't want it to be so philosophical or so deep or so misunderstood that people can't get it. So the greatest compliment I hear all the time is it's easy to read and I get it. I'm like, yes, that's and really want. actionable. I totally agree. And I think it is a real superpower to be able to do that, right? To, yeah. to be able to take something that is, it, you know, it is complex. There are a lot of things you need to do, right? To source great people. Yes. So what's interesting about my audience is you talk about, you just mentioned, you know, sort of. Uh, maybe the the apps make us a little bit lazy. So I would love to have you talk about, you know, sort of your approach to recruiting, because I do think the apps will become more and more prevalent because now the, for the, the, the broader world, right? Because now we can work from anywhere. And so yes. now we're, although for my audience, that's not true, right? So right. It's right. actually <laughs> helpful. It, it aligns with your philosophy because we yes. have to hire locally. But to your point, it gets really tempting to, okay, well, I, the, the net is so wide now. Right. Even I've noticed, so I, we use, I've used Indeed for various roles that I've had. Um, I used it, I, so I used to run the industry association and I remember hiring, looking to hire a marketing person and on Indeed, you had to pay for every market that you wanted to list in, which was not, so we would like pick a couple markets and like hope for the best. Right. Yes. And now that's not the case. Now you just post and you can specify if it's remote and how often somebody needs to be in the office. So it's a huge shift that we've just seen and, and probably right, fairly problematic because you know nothing about the person. And I think right. one of the things you talk about in your book, which like I could argue both sides of is you're hiring for um, ap- you said aptitude and attitude. Mm-hmm. And I think in a lot of cases, that's true. There are probably cases where you need somebody to have yes. specific experience yes. <laughs> to yes. accomplish something, but it has to be coupled with the aptitude and attitude. And I had a hiring situation recently where I was like, yeah, you know what, these are skills that can be learned. And I just need a person that is a great yes. cultural fit and really wants to do the job, right? And I'll right, worry about, and again, not always the case, but so the great news, I think for your approach is that we have to hire locally. So we can't go, mm-hmm. we can use Indeed, but we have to specify geography. So I'd love to hear you talk about, yeah, you're sort of the like, look, every person you talk to is maybe a lead to a candidate. Yes. That might be a good yes. fit. Yeah. yeah. How do you put that hat on? What does that look like? So the visual I like to give people is, is a toolbox. I referred to it earlier. And, and when you can look at all of these assets as various tools, and for someone listening that may not know a thing about tools, <laughs> what they do know is, is if they try and unscrew a screw that has the one line in it, that's called a flathead, and you try and use the screwdriver that looks like a star, they know it's not going to (laughs) work. And that's the most, and so you have to have a different screwdriver. And so I really think now, you know, most times when you, when people use screws or they use, you know, whatever they usually use, uh, uh, the, um, God, now I'm going blank on it. <laughs> they, the the they Phillips use, screwdriver. Yeah, the Phillips. There you go. Thank you. I went blank. <laughs> and so you're probably going to use that most of the time. And, and if you look at all of these assets in a similar fashion, that, hey, I just have some different bits, some different wrenches, some different screwdrivers. I'm going to use all of them, but there's a couple that I use all the time. Um, that's really how you have to look at it. And the challenge with writing a book, in fact, I had, I had a reviewer kind of come back at me yesterday on this whole thing, you know, she was like, Hey, you give a lot of absolutes. And I'm like, yeah, well, the reason you have to do that in a book is because it's not a two way conversation. Let's be honest. A book is really a poor form. It's a, it's a poor form of communication really. So as a writer, you have to go, okay, how am I going to get my core message, my core voice across that will start the conversation? That's all a book is, is is a thought. It's a thought spark and a conversation starter. So let's begin there, that we're looking at a toolbox. 
Third party apps are great. Indeed, Monster, Glassdoor, you know, so on and so on, the list goes on. And you can use those as a tool. My, my point to business leaders is that should never be your foundation. I was working with a business leader a couple of years ago. Um, they own a couple of different local businesses. They probably as an entire company have maybe 75 employees across all their companies. So they are kind of the traditional American small business. Good revenue. They're creating wealth for their family. They're helping their people. Don't have a large team, 75 to 100. They were doing 100% of their hiring through Indeed. 100%. And I walked in the door and said, that's your first mistake. Because they were like, well, people just come and go. Within six months, we're losing everybody. I said, yeah, because you don't know who you're hiring. And so that picture we're painting and the picture you're painting of a co-working owner who maybe only has one or two people, again, that's the majority of businesses in America. So let's throw out the legals. Let's throw out the doctors. Let's throw out the nurses. That's not who we're talking about. Of course, you need those people to have skill sets, certifications, and licenses. I would dare to say 85% of the workforce in America doesn't need certifications, licenses, degrees, et cetera. They're waiters and waitresses and secretaries and assistants and graphic designers. They're all the stuff that you can teach. And so as I told someone yesterday, in fact, I would rather hire someone who doesn't know how to design graphics, but has an interest and a passion for it and pay $500 to put them through a course then I would hire someone who understands graphic design, but is a terrible culture fit because the data shows us if I invest that $500 to $1,000, that person's going to stay with me because people want to know you're investing in them. And so I am 100% okay hiring someone who has no clue about what I need done, but has the aptitude, the attitude, the culture, and the passion. Those people are the ones I'm going to build my team around. You're rarely going to find that through Indeed, Glassdoor, or whatever. In fact, Indeed's new commercial, I heard it on the radio two days ago. They start with this statement. Hiring is about numbers. So they're telling you their philosophy to helping you hire is to throw the net as wide as possible and hope they're disclaiming to you that it's a gamble. They're hoping you find someone. My thing is hiring is about strategy and clarity. And when you know that within 10 minutes of anyone's place of business, you can walk out the door, go to the coffee shop, go to the grocery store, go to the mechanic, and you can find all the people you need for your team. Now, it's going to take action. And what I told someone the other day is you need to, you need to budget an hour a week where you go out and recruit. You don't sit and wait. You don't play the gambit. You actually take action and go recruit. If people would spend an hour a week recruiting that way, I am telling you, Jamie, it would change the game on who you have right in your backyard. There are some amazing people. I go to Starbucks three or four times a week. There's four people there I would recruit in a heartbeat. <laughs> in a sure. heart, Starbucks, Starbucks is amazing at culture. Uh -huh. I would there, I, you know, I go, I love fashion. I love buying shoes. When I, I go to, into uh, Lululemon all the time and I'm like, I've got a list of 20 Lululemon people that when I'm ready to expand, I'm going to recruit them. And so they're right there in your own backyard. And that's how, that's what it takes. If you really want to build that all-star team. And you and I talked about it a little pre-show for those people listening who only have one or two staff, it is so critical. They get it right. But the awesome opportunity is it's also easier to get it right because you can have better clarity on who you want, what yeah. you want them to do, why you want them to do it. And then all you do is go out and find them. They're in front of you. All you do is go out and find them. Hey, I just wanted to jump in really quickly before we continue with our discussion. If you're working on opening a co-working space, I want to invite you to join me for my free masterclass, three behind the scenes secrets to opening a co-working space. If you're working on opening a co-working space, I want to share the three decisions that I've seen successful operators make when they're creating their co-working business. The masterclass is totally free. It's about an hour and includes some Q&A. If you'd like to join me, you can register at everythingcoworking.com forward slash masterclass. If you already have a co-working space, I want to make sure you know about Community Manager University. Community Manager University is a training and development platform for community managers, and it can be for owner operators. It has content training, resources, templates from day one to general manager. The platform includes many courses that cover 
the major buckets of the community manager role from community management, operations, sales and marketing, finance, and leadership. The content is laid out in a graduated learning path. So the community manager can identify what content is most relevant to them, depending on their experience and kind of jump in from there. We provide a live brand new training every single month for the community manager group. We also host a live Q&A call every single month so that the community managers can work through any challenges that they're having or opportunities, um, get ideas from other community managers, build their own peer network. We also have a private Slack group for the group. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go to everythingcoworking.com forward slash community manager. So can you talk a little bit about that clarity? Because I think a temptation we have is like, okay, well, I need someone who knows how to use this app and do, you know, like the, the, the checklist. And your point is like, look, even if you have to invest in helping them learn that, Yes. Yeah, because the culture piece in a small in an even smaller business is such a big deal. Yes. And I think I'm not sure many small business owners take the time to be very intentional about culture, because my thought when I was re reading the book was like, it's probably common for us to say, well, that's a big company thing. I don't have time for that. I, you know, I got a million other things to do. Um, and yet the culture piece is one of the biggest advantages for my audience uh, because it's super compelling to work in a co-working space. There's an amazing yes. network, an amazing community. Most community managers, that's usually the, the name of the role or something similar, maybe it's an operations manager, are really empowered mm -hmm. and they develop to your point, like maybe they're, they're sort of, you know, uh, trial by fire or, you know, jumping into the deep right. end of the pool or whatever you want to say, like right. that can be overwhelming, but over time, the skill, the transferable skills that they learn in that role are really incredible. So it's a great job, but I think a lot of times, right, we don't know how to articulate that and how to sort of make it something that's a recruiting tool. And then right. I'm, I would guess, right, none of us have recruiting as like an hourly thing <laughs> we do right. on right. the to-do list. So yeah. Yeah. Talk about the clarity a little bit. I, I think that's so important and it can be tempting, I think, to avoid that to your point when you go to Indeed and you're just kind of making the to-do list and you're just trying to, you know, match up check boxes. Yes. But yeah. So let, let's start from the foundational um, kind of building part of culture. And, and I really want to dilute it to almost the tip of the spear for the person you just described, you know, that that co-working space owner, one or two people on staff, but they built this great ecosystem for a community of people. So, you know, the, the magic to me about co-working is that it's a, it's a very small business that feels much larger than it actually is. And I think that's a really cool, that that's the point of it, right? To build yeah. community. So let's go tip of the spear for culture with those people in mind. The, the biggest, uh, the kind of the biggest vision I would want people to have is if you're hiring that one person, if they're your front desk person, your operations person, whatever, you have to remember they're representing your brand. Thus, they're representing you. And here's the challenge with having such a small team. One misrepresentation can burn a hundred bridges. But if I go into Lululemon again, because we're gonna we're gonna use them as an example, say they have large, you know, larger company, everyone knows their brand, everyone knows their stores. You walk in and there's a team of 15 people. If I have a bad experience at one Lululemon, I can look across the way and see that someone else is treating a guest the right way. And I can go, okay, maybe that person just isn't trained well, maybe they're having a bad day. I can forgive that a lot easier. Whereas if I work into your co-working spot. And I know there's only one person and they don't treat me well, I may write you off. And that's just how human nature works. You don't go on yeah. Yelp. You don't go on Yelp and see all the great reviews normally. You go on Yelp and you see, and that's for some reason human nature keeps score that way. And so my point is culturally, don't get freaked out by maybe the difficulty and the depth of culture. Just look at it as whoever is representing me and my brand. I need to get that right from an attitude standpoint, from a present standpoint, because they're the first and last thing, interaction 
speech, whatever that people are going to see. So it's even more pivotal when you only have one or two people. And, and so that's so important. Good, good news, bad news. <laughs> that's you only exactly have to right. get one right, but it's, the, the, the it's great everything. News is, the great news is you're much more adaptable and you can control it. And so that's the great news of it. So let's go to clarity. Um, the greatest analogy is this, because everyone gets it. When, when you start your co-working business, any business, and you maybe talk to a marketing person or you study some marketing, what's the first question they ask? Who's your ideal customer? Yeah. That's the first question I ask my, my students. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> who, are, who are they pointing to? And then you go through, okay, what do they look like? Where do they shop? Where do they eat? What cars do they drive? What time do they get home at night? Do they have a family? Or I mean, you go through the gamut of marketing. Jamie, that's the same thing you use when providing clarity for who you want to work with you. Where do they hang out? What hobbies do they have? What books do they read? What does their friend circle look like? What are their interests? What are their passions? What are their skills? You can ask that question. So really what we're doing is we're taking marketing 101 yeah. and just applying it to hiring right. 101. And that gives you the clarity. And what I even tell people is do what they tell you to do in marketing. Print a picture of that. I mean, I know businesses that they'll, they'll send off to a graphic designer to create their person. If you go to almost any corporate business, you're going to walk into their marketing room and they're probably going to have something like that printed out because it keeps it top of mind, right? And so that's the same thing we're, we're applying to hiring. Maybe where do they work now? I was working with someone a few months ago who was hiring his first assistant and he, he's in the book world and the writing world. And my first question was, well, when's the last time you went to a bookstore and recruited someone? And he's like, I never thought about that. And I said, well, it only makes sense because you said the first thing you want them to be is passionate about books. Well, where do you find the person passionate about books? They're working in a bookstore. Sure enough, he goes to a bookstore. Guess what he finds? The person that he recruited. And so even someone in the middle of that world, sometimes we can't see the 50,000 foot view because we're in the weeds. And so, you know, that's really what I would tell the people listening is use that marketing scenario to find out who you want to hire, gain clarity on it. And then all you simply have to do is go manifest that through finding that person. And so you go to the coffee shop, you go to the bookstores, you go to the grocery store. And when people treat you well, you take note of that. When someone goes out of their way to do something for you, you take note of that. And maybe you say, hey, Jamie, thanks for your service. I'm looking for great people. Do you know anyone looking? That's the question. And it's as easy as that. And so, you know, I said people can budget an hour a week, but really they already have the hour a week because right. everyone goes first. It's the Starbucks shopping. visit. It's the Uber ride. Everybody it's does the, it. Yeah. It's just, yep. Yeah, it's just being alert and being aware. And it's not, not an added effort, really. And so, yeah, when you're hiring a team of one, two, three, four, five, you should be able to find the exact people you want for the most part, 90% of the time and be able to find them within your backyard. It's really simple. Yeah. So the, my little arguing voice is saying, well, if I only pull from the people I'm like exposed to, I could have, I could hire anyone in the whole world. Like, am yeah. I not trying hard enough? Am I not getting the best possible person? Um, you know, then the response is really, what does it matter? I mean, if you're finding the people that you want, yeah. does it really matter where they're located? And I, and I think that is a little bit of the downside of the World Wide Web opportunity, yeah. right? This it's whole like, world old, is your oyster feeling yeah, like we, you know, we over dating apps, it. like all the, right, yeah. so much we possibility. It. Yeah. And so let's go back to the toolbox. Let's go back to the toolbox because you're not wrong in that argument, by the way. It is a great question. Remember, we said we have a couple of tools that we use constantly. And for recruiting and hiring, that's going to be having clarity on who we need and why we need them, going in our own backyard and finding them every day, but still throw that stuff out on Indeed. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm yeah. saying that should, that's your 1%, what I call it because I'm from the South, that's your gravy on the biscuits, right? That's like, <laughs> that's like the bonus meal yeah. to this whole thing that you're doing. And so still use that stuff so you can actually still get you know your kind of rebuttal there. You can still have that. What's great is, you're not pressed to feel like you have to have those people. So then they become an option. It's like, wait a second. I found this great person in Nebraska. I may want to recruit them. Do it because you're not solely dependent on that person. That's now a bonus, by the way, which is a great trick to really grow your business when you can control and really maintain the core of who you're hiring and recruiting. And then you throw some all stars in on top of that. That's going to elevate your, your opportunities exponentially. 
So I'm also thinking that your approach um, reduces the emergency hiring. Yes, I because, call it desperation. Yeah, in our, I talk about this a lot. Um, so I help folks start co-working spaces and then I help them run it. I also run a program called Community Manager University. And we'll talk a little bit about how much employees appreciate investment, but we talk often about the challenge with hiring is that in our world, if you are an owner that is cannot be in the space mm -hmm. and your community manager gives notice, that's an emergency. That's a 911. Yes. And so now you're hiring under duress. If you haven't been doing the activities that you're talking about and you don't have right. that sort of Rolodex of like, oh, so-and-so right. at the bookstore, the Starbucks or the, yes. yeah. So you use the word that I love to use, and a lot of people don't know it because, you know, you and I's generation, we used physical <laughs> Rolodexes, Yeah. <laughs> which for those people that don't know, back before phones, it was like this big plastic thing on your desk that you just kept a handwritten file, right? So um, that's exactly the word I use is this recruiting becomes what I call lifestyle recruiting. It, it's not, you're not recruiting because you need to. You're recruiting because you're constantly aware of upgrading. And there's a little bit of a kind of a scientific approach to that from the standpoint of, oh my gosh, I only have a team of three. If I continue recruiting, I can't really hire those people. Right, right. So then, then all you do is change your phrasing. Then all that becomes is, hey, Jamie, I loved your service today. You know, if you know anybody that's ever looking, I'm always looking for potential opportunities to bring people on. So if I ever have an opportunity, I'd love to visit. So you just change your phrasing a little bit where you don't set an unrealistic expectation, but you do what I like to call you plant a seed. And sometimes I've had situations where I kind of quote recruited, I really you're building relationships is what you're doing. I've done that for years, three or four or five years. And then all of a sudden the time came that I thought, Ooh, they're the piece, the missing piece to the puzzle. And you go back and you've built that relationship. And so now they hop on board and you're very proactive in what you're doing and you're constantly building that Rolodex. And a lot of times people say, well, I don't have time or I don't have the energy for that. And my statement is, and I use it in the book, saying you can't find great people, saying you don't have the time to is like saying you can't grow your business. And no successful business person would ever say that. Say that, yeah. And so really that's the proactive approach to avoiding that emergency hiring. Now, does life happen? Yes, but let's go back to our toolbox again. If I'm lifestyle recruiting constantly, I'm building my Rolodex, I will soon have 20, 30, 40 people potentially that I can contact. I may not recruit them in, you know, individually but, or directly, but they have a circle of friends, birds of a feather flock together. So they have a circle of friends who they can tap into as well. So I'm building that Rolodex. I also have Indeed, Glassdoor, Monster. So I have all these tools in my toolbox now where I'm not limited. Very rarely in that scenario will you face what you call emergency hiring. You just won't have them because you'll always have that Rolodex of people. Yeah, it's, it's a great way to think about hiring. Um, so you, I made a note, page 35 in the book, the why is... <laughs> The why is everything. I was like, the why is everything. Yeah. But we yeah. can forget that, yes. especially I think going back to sort of that scarcity mindset of like, oh, okay, I'm a smaller employer. I may not, you know, are my salaries the highest? Am I offering all the right benefits? You know, challenges that smaller businesses have. But yes. yeah, can you talk about that mindset of, of how to create a great place to work and attract people? So first of all, let's let's get rid of the myth about money, right? Because there is a myth there. And the myth is, and the data shows this, is we're talking, um, there's some studies that go back 40, 50, 60 years, and they have so much data on, do people really take a job for money? And the answer is a resounding no. Um, last year, there was some new data that came out that said the majority of people who take a job for more money, so they switch jobs, it's less than a 20% increase. These aren't $150,000 a year workers. <laughs> These are like $15 to $20 an hour workers. So the money isn't substantial when you start looking at that. And the other part of the data is those people that do jump ship for money, guess what they normally do again? Jump ship again. Yeah. And so that's such a minority issue. It's such a small percentage of the pie that you're right. It just becomes the scarcity myth that we feed ourselves. 
Um, I would argue that because of the last 18 months, people are valuing experience and culture even more at this point in time. And so actually the leverage is to the business owner. If you create a great culture and you invest in value people, you're going to be able to find people like crazy moving forward. So let's get rid of that first. The why is the most important. Here's the challenge. Most people don't sit with their why. They don't, it's vulnerable. It's like, okay, so why are you really running a business? Why are you really stepping into this? What, what is your purpose and vision for this? That's a vulnerable place to be. It's kind of what I call sitting in the ashes, right? You're just like, oh my gosh, why do I want to start a business? Why do I want to build this community? What is there really a need or what, I mean, what's going on? But you have to identify that why, because I talk a lot about alignment. You're not, you're going to struggle finding people to align with your place of, of business if you don't know your why. That's the first piece of clarity you have to have. So then when you know your why, that's going to reflect on who you hire. So let's say you hire Susie to be your operations manager, and you, you've got this detailed list of what you need her to do every single day, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just a list. It's, okay, Susie, this is why it fits our culture. Okay, Susie, this is why this is so valuable for you to get done every day. Okay, Susie, this is why this is giving value to our tenants and to our community. And when someone understands that why, they're seeing the reflection of the overall purpose. And now they feel like they can walk in the door every day and go, I'm important. I'm valuable because if I don't get this done, I understand with clarity that something's not going to work properly. Gone is the day that you can say, Susie, get this done. Has to be done. That, that, and I love it. I love it that we have a generation of people that are like, okay, well, so what's the reason in this? Why are you asking me to type up this document all the time? I don't get it. And so give people that purpose, that why. And I think a lot of business leaders, especially small business leaders, they get really weird about vulnerability. Um, because a lot of small business leaders are, it's a local family business. Maybe it's been in their family for generations. And so there's a lot of mysticism there. And they're like, well, we can't tell our people too much. And I'm like, that's, that's, a, that's a pile because you need to tell your people as much as possible. Because when you do, that's going to give them that purpose and that vision. And they're going to now take pride in what they're doing. When people know the why, they're going to go with finishing the task to the best of their ability. Yeah. And their, and their retention there because they, yes. they get, they get right. You're connecting with their why. And yes. I mean, I think that's why I, I kind of like highlighted. It's like, um, yeah, I mean, you talk, yeah, you talked about why people work and you mentioned greater purpose, which we're so fortunate in our business we can, we can show, demonstrate that like yes. in very authentically all day long, but to your point, I, yeah, maybe we don't, you know, maybe owners don't think about sort of sharing their why, because to your point, new, a lot of new owners are, yeah, maybe they're not comfortable talking about it out loud or haven't articulated it out loud, or they're still like, I don't know, is this thing going to work? Right. And, and I have right. to talk somebody into, you know, you're, yeah. you have to get somebody on board with your vision. Um, but I think that lines up with leadership. They can trust appreciation and mentorship. You know, those were all under in, in your um, section about why people work. And to your point, those don't really line up with dollars. There might be some dollars no. in terms of, you know, no. training or a, a, a thank you gift card or, you know, whatever it is, but it's not, um, you know, a constant salary discussion. And the crazy thing is, if you operate in the way that we've laid out in the book, you're going to increase opportunity and revenue. You're going to increase experience of your clients, your tenants, whatever, which is actually going to empower you to potentially pay people more money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's the crazy thing is people are like, well, I'm worried about, you know, am I going to be able to pay them enough? We'll do the right things. And the answer is yes, you will be able to pay them enough because it's going to make sense. And we also have to remember, like you just pointed out currency, there, there are countless forms of currency. And we often limit our mindset to money is the only currency, but that's not true. 
humanity is a currency, gratitude is a currency, work ethic is a currency, appreciation is a currency. So we can go down the line and the more you give value to those things, a simple thank you may actually go further than that 15% raise. Because, you know, let's just play this out. We're all humans, we're all flesh and blood, we all have experiences. If we go back to hire Susie, let's say Susie has, you know, not a great relationship in her personal life, great worker, we recruited her, we think she's gonna be awesome. That simple thank you may actually be the greatest currency that Susie has in her life. And when that comes from the person that hired her, you know, there's still a little bit of a mental place of authority there for that employee. And now it's all of a sudden like, wow, Jamie really appreciates me. I'll do anything for her. And that's a different story that we're telling all of a sudden. And that's why that why is so important. You know, it'd be kind of funny, kind of funny, kind of fun to, to across the co-working industry to ask the leaders, hey, have you taken your team and explained to them why you began this business? That'd be an interesting thing to find out because my guess is like a lot of business industries, many of them haven't. And that's an important, that's where it starts. We, we created this co-working place because there was a need in our community and the entrepreneurial industry was growing and we felt like we wanted to meet that need and we were able to. Oh, wow, that's a cool vision. So now where are you going with it? Well, here's where we're going with it. And that's where the story begins. And that just starts tapping into that potential and that opportunity of connection. Yeah. And that connection piece is the other part of, I think the benefit, the, the benefit of being a smaller business yes. Yes. is because they, they have that direct line. And for some yeah. folks, that's a big why too, right. To feel like I always, after business school, I worked for, um, a big, uh, food company. And I just, yeah, felt like just, just like yeah. cog in the wheel. I am a small company. I want to feel like yes. I have a lot of ownership and everything I do every day is like really important, not just a teeny bit important. And right. I'm not sitting in a meeting with 20 people and the meeting doesn't, you know, really mean anything. It's like, no, everything's important. And direct access to an owner is a, is a big deal. That's what I love about the mentorship piece, right? If you, you know, and in my opinion, if you have a team of 100 to 200 or less, which, you know, obviously the majority of the people we're talking with today do, God, that mentorship piece is so empowering because you have the ability to impact every single person on a, on a consistent level. Maybe you're not in your location every day. Maybe you have multiple locations, but somehow or another, my encouragement to leaders is that even if you have multiple locations, that somehow or another, you impact those people multiple times a week, I would say daily if possible. That might just be through a phone call. It might be through a text message. It may be through a simple email or whatever. It doesn't take long, 30 seconds, and you can make an impact. And that's the advantage of small businesses and small teams is as the leader, you can make a direct empowering ripple effect really quickly in a really short period of time that's going to go a long way. Yeah, it's, yes, uh, the one of the rewarding aspects um, of what can be challenging <laughs> to be a yeah. small business owner. Um, okay, Mitch, I feel like I could talk about this all day long. <laughs> very thought provoking. And um, I think everybody's probably thinking about, so, I mean, so tell so okay. So the book, where can we get the book for those watching online? Yeah. It looks like. Any, anywhere you order books, how to hire and keep great people. Uh, Mitch Gray, G-R-A-Y is how you spell the last name. I encourage people, if you have a local bookstore, um, you know, most local bookstores are tapped into national distribution. Please go try and order it there first so we can support local. But if you don't have that opportunity and you're a, a, an online buyer, you can order it anywhere. Yeah, it's available. So um, well, tell us if you're, you mentioned in the pre-chat that you're working on um, something even more mm. detailed to help. Are you ready to pre preview that or can you tell us where to follow you if if folks are interested in kind of what's next and in, in getting even more practical about becoming a better better hirer? Let's announce it today. What do you okay. say? <laughs> <Let's out. laughs> so um, I, I actually wrote this book with a curriculum in mind. And, and when you read the book, I think you can tell it's very, you know, it's got a lot of step-by-step -step stuff. It's very kind of curriculum based. And so we're able to finally do that. We're, we're creating a curriculum. It'll, it'll be, it'll probably be a couple of months before it's out. 
Um, it'll be, you know, I, I'm not sure what the price will be on it yet, but it'll be nominal. It'll be well worth people's time and money. And we'll have a standalone website for that curriculum as well. So it's going to be a really cool system that we're building that people can access. And the great thing is um, they're going to be able to access the curriculum and they don't necessarily have to read the book. So, but if they read the book, they're most likely going to want to get into the right. curriculum because it's going to, it's going <laughs> to yeah. dig into the nuts That's and how bolts. I feel from reading the book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So um, I'm excited about that. We also have another website um, that's not up yet. It's going to be recruitgreatpeople.com. And it's just going to have some free tools, some tips and tricks, a little bit of expansion on the book. But, it, but really our idea with that website is, you know, if you're sitting there one day and you're frustrated with hiring, you could go to recruitgreatpeople.com, get some encouragement, get some tips and take some action immediately. Or if you're sitting with your team, maybe you have someone helping you hire or whatever. So it's going to kind of be a resource site. Um, it'll be a little bit skinny when we first bring it out because I just want to get it launched and then we're going to add to it. So it's going to be a really evolving thing. And then I always do consulting and coaching. Um, so if there's a leader that just wants one-on-one -on -one leadership consulting, we have some opportunity for that. And then, you know, if you want to work with your team or come in and help redesign your culture, if you want me to come, you know, I'll, I'll fly to Washington and go walk with you for the day and teach you how to recruit. I love that stuff. You'll go to Starbucks with us. Oh, oh, I love that stuff. I'll buy your coffee. So we do have some packages and opportunity for that. And, uh, and so we've got, yeah, it's the next few months are going to be really, really fun, really fun. So. So Mitch, I have in our show notes, your website, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Where are you most often? Um, LinkedIn and Instagram are probably the best. Yeah, probably the best. Um, MitchGrayMedia.com is what you have on probably, I'm sure. And there's some great resources there. Uh, and we'll kind of, you know, if you follow me on LinkedIn or Instagram, especially, you'll see the announcements rolling out of where to go. But okay, um, awesome. yeah. Yeah. And your M gray media gray with an yes. A on Instagram. And that's all in the show notes, which you can find on our website. So Mitch, thank you. I've gotten a ton out of our talk today and from your book. Awesome. So I love I it. You taking the time. Thank you, Jamie. This has been wonderful. And I would love to work with some folks and, and uh, let's, let's get hiring right. So we can reduce the stress level of everything. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you.